to get a lot bumpier, Jane, because of the issues around the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, uh, problems about the post-trade uh, Brexit trade arrangements uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, and this is an issue that's now come into a head. He's trying to get a deal uh, before the Good Friday Agreement anniversary, the 25-year an um, anniversary. Uh, and he's coming up uh, with some resistance, if you like, from Brexiteers on his benches, uh, from the DUP. So it's not been the easiest of starts for him anyway. There wasn't any honeymoon period for Rishi Sunak. And now there's talk about, is it going to get a lot more difficult? Because as one uh, senior Brexiteer said to me last night, if he can't get the DUP to agree the deal, he can't get the U European Research Group uh, to agree the deal, that group of Brexiteer backbenchers, then he's got a party management problem. And I think what you'll see today here is Keir Starmer asking lots of questions on the deal and then doing the whole, I will uh, get this through Parliament, you can have my votes. But look what happened with Theresa May when she got into that situation. Eventually, she was forced out of office. So this is sort of tricky times for, for the Prime Minister. National moment of reflection, which will give us the opportunity to pay tribute to the courage of the Ukrainian people and demonstrate our solidarity with Ukraine. Mr. Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Andrew West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I associate myself with the Prime Minister's comments with regard to the bravery of the Ukrainian people? Labour have asked his government on three occasions to commit to a police response to every domestic abuse yeah. call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To date, no answer has been forthcoming. Could the Prime Minister provide a response today? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, M Mr Speaker, just this week we announced new measures to tackle violence against women and girls. This is a government that introduced the landmark Domestic Abuse Act that's rolling out specialist advisers for those who suffer and putting more funding to support victims. We will continue to do everything we can to make sure that women and girls are safe everywhere in our country. The warm welcome given to Ukrainian refugees by so many is extremely heartwarming. Does the Prime Minister understand, though, how upset my constituents are to have bookings for weddings and other special family events cancelled when the Home Office took over a much-loved hotel? And will he redouble his efforts to put an end to this practice? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, I, uh, my honourable friends, constituents, and indeed the whole country, can be proud of the welcome that they have given to people from Ukraine over the last year. And I can assure him that we are committed to reducing the number of asylum seekers living in hotels at vast cost to taxpayers and considerable disruption to communities. Uh, I'm grateful to the leadership of the Home Secretary and the Immigration Minister in finding a sustainable solution. And the Home Secretary will make a formal update in the coming weeks on progress in standing up alternative sites for accommodation. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join the Prime Minister in his comments about Ukraine? I had the privilege last week of seeing firsthand the courage and resilience of the Ukrainian people, and we must continue to stand united in this House in support of Ukraine. Yeah. Mr Speaker, can I also say that the thoughts of the whole House, I'm sure the whole country, will be with the family of Nicola Bully at this very, very difficult time. And can I welcome the new member for West Lancashire yeah. to her first PMQs. Mr Speaker, the Labour Party is proud to be the party of the Good Friday Agreement and peace and prosperity in Northern Ireland. We welcome attempts to make the protocol work more effectively. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that it has been poorly implemented and that the basis for any deal must be removing unnecessary checks on goods? Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, Mr. Mr Speaker, let me welcome the uh, Honourable Lady to her place and associate myself with the remarks of the Honourable Gentleman uh, about Nicola Bully's family. Our thoughts are, of course, with them. Uh, as he knows, we are still in active discussions with the European Union, but he should know that I am a Conservative, a Brexiter and a Unionist, and any agreement that we reach needs to tick all three boxes. Yeah. It needs to ensure sovereignty for Northern Ireland it needs to safeguard Northern Ireland's place in our union, and it needs to find practical solutions to the problems faced by people and businesses. I will be resolute in fighting for what is best for Northern Ireland and the United Kingdom. Yeah. Mr Speaker, we all agree that the protocol can be improved. 
But there are trade-offs, and we need to face up to them. His predecessor told businesses that there would be no forms, no checks, no barriers of any kind. That was absolute nonsense, and it destroyed trust. So, in the interests of restoring that trust, will he confirm that to avoid a hard border on the island of Ireland, the deal he's negotiating is going to see Northern Ireland continue to follow some EU law? Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I think that the Honourable Gentleman is jumping ahead. We are still... We're, we are still... We are still in intensive, intensive discussions with the European Union to ensure that we can find agreement that meets the test that I set, and that is sovereignty for Northern Ireland. It's Northern Ireland's place in our precious union, and it is to find practical solutions to the problems faced by people and businesses. I have spent time engaging and listening to those communities in Northern Ireland, businesses and political parties. I have a good understanding of what is required, and I will keep fighting until we get it. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister is biting his tongue, but at some point the irreconcilables on his benches are going to twig and they're going to come after him. The former Trade Minister says there can be no role for the European Court of Justice in Northern Ireland. So will the Prime Minister be honest with them and tell them that's not going to happen? Mr. 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 Speaker, now again, we, we need to keep going to actually secure an acceptable agreement. But for the Honourable Gentleman to be talking about a deal that he hasn't even seen, that we're... That we're that we, are still, that we are still negotiating, that isn't finalised, and it's, it's his usual position when it comes to the European Union. It, it's give the EU a blank cheque and agree to anything they offer. It's, it's, not, it's not a strategy, Mr Speaker, that's surrender. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker. It's not my questions he's avoiding, it's their questions he's avoiding. His predecessors wasted months pushing the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. If implemented, it would tie us up in battles with the EU, the United States and others at precisely the time we should be building common ground to boost our economy and show unity against Putin. Now, the Prime Minister clearly wants a closer relationship with the EU, so can he confirm that if there's a deal, he will pull the protocol bill. Yeah. Prime Minister. M Mr Speaker, look, what the, the Honourable Gentleman wants to put the EU first. I want to put Northern Ireland first. And, 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 on, and on these questions, and on these questions he, the Honourable Gentleman said he would respect the result of the referendum, and then he promised to back a second one. All the while, he was constantly voting to frustrate Brexit. And I know what the British people know, that on this question, he can't be trusted to stick up for Britain. Mr Speaker, the sound you hear is them cheering the Prime Minister, pulling the wool over their eyes. It's the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, the 30th anniversary of the Downing Street Declaration. Tony Blair and John Major both recognise that politics in Northern Ireland is built on trust and not telling people what they want to hear, and the need to take seriously the concerns of both communities, nationalists and unionists. It's vital their voices are heard. So can the Prime Minister confirm that whatever deal he brings back, this House will get a vote on it? Yeah. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, of course, of course Parliament will express its view. But what is crucial? But what, what is crucial here? But what is crucial here is that, that this, is not, this is not about his desire to play political games in this House with this situation. This is about what is best for the people and communities of Northern Ireland. And that, Mr Speaker, is what I will keep fighting for. Well, Mr Speaker, I take it from that that this House will get a vote, and I look forward to that vote in due course. Because everyone knows the basis of this deal has been agreed for weeks. But it's the same old story. 
the country has to wait while he plucks up the courage to take on the malcontents, the reckless, the wreckers on his own benches. But I am here to tell him he does not need to worry about that because we will put country before party and ensure that Labour votes to get it through. He should accept our offer, ignore the howls of indignation from those on his side who will never take yes for an answer. Why doesn't he just get on with it? Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, what, what I am doing is talking and listening to the people of Northern Ireland. That is the right thing to do. It is to make sure that we can respond and resolve to the concerns of the unionist communities and businesses in Northern Ireland, and that is what I will keep doing. But, Mr Speaker, we know that the Honourable Gentleman talks about his plans. We have heard that tomorrow he is going to announce five missions, but we, all, we, all, we already know what they are. It's uncontrolled immigration, it's reckless spending, it's higher debt, and it's softer sentences. And for the fifth pledge, the fifth pledge, Mr. Speaker, we all know it's that he reserves the right to change his mind on the other four. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, last year, the coroner determined that content promoted at Molly Russell that promoted self-harm and suicide contributed to her death, but they were only able to make that decision after years of campaigning by the Russell family and the coroners to gain access to that information. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that other families should not have to suffer as the Russell family have suffered, and that relevant data, data relevant to the death of a child should be more readily available both to families and to the coroner's service than it currently is? Minister. Uh, can I uh, join my right honourable friend in paying tribute to the Russell family for their tireless and dignified campaigning on behalf of all families who have been bereaved in such tragic circumstances? The companies already have, uh, the coroners rather, already have statutory powers to require evidence to be given or produced for the purposes of their investigation. But the government is listening carefully to the concerns of parliamentary colleagues and to bereaved families. The Ministry of Justice and Department for Science, Innovation and Technology are leading those discussions to ensure that we have the right set of procedures in place. We now come to the leader of the SNP, Stephen Flynn. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, wholesale, wholesale gas prices have fallen by 75 per cent since their peak. Yet in just a matter of weeks, the British government, the Westminster government, intends to increase energy bills by a further £500. What would motivate a Prime Minister to do such a thing? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Prime Minister. Mr. Mr Speaker, what we are doing is providing tens of billions of pounds of support for people with their energy bills, particularly the most vulnerable. What we're also doing, uh, opposed by the SNP, is to invest in producing more homegrown gas here in the UK and the North Sea. But I would say to the honourable gentleman, as one of his own, I, I saw one of his own members of parliament said this week, that if the SNP were a pizza company, their products would be slow, wrong, and costly. <laughs> I would say to him, it's time to focus on the issues that matter to the people of Scotland, and producing more energy is absolutely one of them. Stephen Flynn. I'm not sure that inferring that energy bills, Mr. Speaker, don't matter to the people of Scotland is a winning strategy for this prime minister. But let's get real. The fact that wholesale gas prices have fallen by 75 per cent means a windfall to the Prime Minister and the Chancellor of around £15 billion. Pounds. So what they are saying as it stands is that they intend to raid the pockets of ordinary Scots whilst lining the pockets of Westminster. Mr Speaker, it is time to set aside. It is time to set aside any notion of an energy price increase to instead protect households and perhaps reduce bills by £500. Does he not agree? Mr Speaker, we are saving households across the United Kingdom, including in Scotland, £900 with their energy bills as a result of our energy bill guarantee. And in the coming years, we will spend £12 billion protecting particularly the most vulnerable families, pensioners across the United Kingdom. But the best way... The best way to reduce people's bills is to halve inflation, as we have promised to do, and it is to produce more homegrown energy here in the United Kingdom. That's something that this government supports. Maybe he could confirm whether the SNP supports that. Jerome Mayo. 
Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister was well aware of the dogged campaign of the Honourable Member for North West Norfolk for a rebuild of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in King's Lynn. It's a hospital constructed from failing aerated concrete, where ceilings are now supported by more than 3,000 wooden and metal props. But is the Prime Minister also aware of the strength of feeling locally in support of the rebuild, not just in North West Norfolk, but in Broadland, North Norfolk, Norwich North, Mid Norfolk, South West Norfolk, Huntingdon, North West Cambridgeshire and South Holland and the Deeplings, whose populations are all served by this hospital. Will he support our campaign? Can I uh, thank my honourable friend and indeed the, uh, my honourable friend from North West Norfolk uh, because I know they are great supporters of this project and I know over the last uh, year or so the Queen Elizabeth Hospital has been allocated over £50 million to address the most immediate issues of the site but I also know they have expressed their interest in being part of the new hospital programme. The department is looking through all those bids. He'll know that I can't comment on specific ones but the selected hospitals will be announced in due course. Sir Geoffrey Donalds. Can I thank the Prime Minister for his efforts uh, in relation to the Northern Ireland Protocol? It is unacceptable that Northern Ireland has been put in this place with a protocol imposed upon us that harms our place in the United Kingdom. It must be replaced with arrangements that are acceptable and restore our place in the United Kingdom and its internal market. Does the Prime Minister accept how important the constitutional and democratic issues are in relation to getting a solution? And will he agree with me that it is unacceptable that EU laws are imposed on Northern Ireland with no democratic scrutiny or consent? And will he assure me that he will address these fundamental constitutional issues and do so not just by tweaking the protocol, but by rewriting the legally binding treaty text. Yeah. Prime Minister. Can I thank the right honourable gentleman for his question, but also thank him for the role that he has played in recent months in articulating unionist concerns. Uh, I have heard loud and clear when he says he wants and needs these issues resolved so that he has a basis to work with others to restore power sharing, and I know that that is genuine. He raised the question of practical issues, and it is vital that these are addressed. But he also raises, Mr Speaker, a vital question about the constitutional and legal framework in which these arrangements exist. And I can assure him that I agree. Addressing the democratic deficit is an essential part of the negotiations that remain ongoing with the European Union. And just as he has been consistent, so have I. And I can assure him that this is at the very heart of the issues that must be addressed. Mr McVeigh. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister has made fixing illegal immigration across the Channel one of his key top priorities. He's also said that legislation will be required to stop it. I completely agree. So, can he tell us when we can expect to see this legislation coming forward as time is of the essence? And can he explain why sorting out this issue did not feature on the Home Office Permanent Secretary's stated top three priorities for his department? Prime Minister. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, thank the Honourable, uh, my Honourable Friend for her, for her question. She's right, illegal crossings put people's lives at risk, it diverts resources away from those in genuine need, and it's unfair on those who migrate here legally. And that's why one of our five pledges to the British people is to stop the boats. We are working at pace on the legislation. It's important that it works. Uh, and in the meantime, our deals with Albania and France are already yielding benefits. But what I can tell her is that we want a system whereby if someone arrives in our country illegally, they will not be able to stay. Instead, they will be detained and removed to a country that they come from or a safe third alternative. That is the system that the Home Secretary and I are working hard to, to put in place, and that is what our legislation will deliver. How about G. Singh Thank you, Roger. Mr Speaker, thanks to the Prime Minister's policies, we are now inflicted with the highest tax burden and the biggest drop in disposable income since yeah. the Second yeah. World War. And to yeah. make matters worse, tens of billions of pounds of taxpayer money was wasted on a world-beating test and trace system. Yeah. Billions on PPE that wasn't even fit for purpose. Not to mention the endless list 
of crony COVID contracts going to Tory yeah. chums yeah. who profiteered at the expense of other people's misery. Yeah. So when will the Prime Minister help us to recover some of that lost money so that striking nurses, teachers and other public yeah. servants can be paid the decent wage that they so richly deserve? Yeah. Well, Mr. Mr Speaker, I'm, uh, I'm very pleased that the Government is in intensive talks with the Royal College of Nursing to find a way forward. As I've always said, we are keen to discuss these terms and conditions, and I'm glad that those conversations are now happening. What I'd say to the Honourable Gentleman is he really cares about the impact of working people, then maybe him and his party should stand up to their union paymasters and back our minimum service laws. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd like to thank the Prime Minister for his support in the launch of the new regulatory reform group. Would the Prime Minister commit to working with our group in two specific areas? The first, to improve the accountability and responsiveness of our regulators to both stakeholders and to Parliament. And secondly, to improve the economic potential in key growing areas of the economy, such as financial services, artificial intelligence and advanced manufacturing. Prime Minister. Well, uh, my uh, my honourable friend makes an excellent point, and he's right about the importance of getting our regulatory framework right to drive growth and prosperity. That's why my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, has set out an extensive review of retained EU law in five key growth areas, including life sciences, green industries and digital technology. But also, the Government Chief Scientific Advisor is leading work to consider how the UK can better regulate emerging technologies technologies, enabling their rapid and safe introduction. And David. It was a pleasure to meet the delegation from Key before questions and to confirm that across this House we are united in our support for Ukraine and its brave heroes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, the Conservative Manifesto promised 40 new hospitals. Oh. After three years, most of these hospitals haven't even got planning permission yet. Yeah. And communities feel betrayed and taken for granted. As ITV showed yesterday, St Helier Hospital in South London is literally crumbling, but there's still no plan to save it. Hinchingbrook Hospital in Cambridgeshire has sewage leaking into its wards and a roof that could collapse at any moment. Does the Prime Minister agree that these are conditions no patients, doctors or nurses should have to put up with? Can he tell the House... Just before we do, please don't take advantage of the order paper for all this. Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm proud that we're investing record sums into the NHS under this government. Also record sums in NHS capital, not just going on upgrading almost 100 hospitals, developing 40 large-scale developments, as the Honourable Gentleman knows, but also investing in more scanners, more ambulances across the board so we can deliver vital care to people. And I'm very pleased that the most recent statistics on urgent emergency care show considerable improvement from the challenges we faced over December, and we now are on a clear path to getting people the treatment they need in the time that they need it. Two o'clock. I welcome the government's commitment to tackling illegal migration and particularly the issue of small boats. But can I ask my right honourable friends if he will reconsider the government's proposal to relocate approximately 500 single male asylum seekers to Beaconside in Stafford? Yeah. And can I ask him to meet with me urgently to discuss this, given the huge amount of objections I've received from constituents on this issue? Yeah. Prime Minister. Yeah. Well, firstly, Mr Speaker, can I welcome my honourable friend back to her place? Yeah. And I know that this is an issue that is concerning her and her constituents, uh, and it's why we must absolutely stop the boats and stem the tide of illegal migrants to relieve this pressure on our local communities. Uh, but I will ensure that she meets with the Home Secretary as soon as possible to discuss her concerns, and hopefully we can arrange that meeting uh, in the coming days. John McNally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. This month, the Scottish Child Payment marks its two-year anniversary. Yeah, yeah. In a cost-of-living crisis, this policy has been a lifeline to hundreds of thousands of people in Scotland. Yeah, 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 yeah. Therefore, will the Prime Minister follow the leadership of the Scottish Government and introduce an equivalent child payment? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. 
Well, I'm, uh, Mr Speaker, the, the best way to ensure uh, that children grow up uh, not in poverty is to make sure they grow up in a, not to grow up in a workless household. And that's why I'm proud that under the record of the Conservative Government, there are almost a million fewer children growing up in workless households, hundreds of thousands fewer children in poverty. And that's because this Government is on the side of parents and will make sure that they have the jobs they need, because ultimately that is the best poverty strategy, is to have everybody in work. David Mundell. Mr Speaker, I previously called out in this House the appalling level of service that my constituents and yours received from train operator TransPennine. Last month, TransPennine had the largest number of cancellations of any service provider in the UK, but it turns out that even this figure was fiddled because TransPennine had cancelled over a thousand trains before 10.30 the night before so that they don't show up in the statistics. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that this practice is totally unacceptable, as is their level of service? Well, I, I, uh, I agree with my right honourable friend. The current service levels are unacceptable. Uh, the Rail North Partnership, which is managing the contract, is working with the company on an improvement plan. My honourable friend, the Rail Minister, is having weekly meetings with Rail North Partnership to monitor its progress. And whilst the TransPennine contract expires in May, uh, and we are working on a new contract. If ministers conclude that the operator cannot be turned around, then other decisions may have to be made. Richard Ford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Of the 40 promised new hospitals referred to by my right honourable friend, 11 of those are in the southwest of England. Three of them surround my constituency in Barnstable, Dorchester, and Taunton but none of them has planning permission. Whoa. It's been reported that staff at Eastbourne District General Hospital were told that their town would not get a new hospital and that it was, quote, a bare-faced lie. Given that the Prime Minister claims his mandate rests on a manifesto that promised 40 new hospitals, when will we see them? Uh, well, Mr Speaker, the Government is committed to building 40 new hospitals as part of the new hospital programme. In the South West, eight eight out of the 11 schemes do have full outline planning permission approved and the remaining three schemes due to when they are delivered uh, due to be delivered would not be expected to have planning permission at this stage and we're working with the trust to go through that process so everything is on track and we will bring those hospitals to the people in the southwest Stephen, sir. Oh, it's 3 million pounds sent to Wolverhampton to trial the new better health app which will support Wolf Runians make better choices. Fulfilling lives is absolutely part of our plan, and that's why we're investing in football pitches, tennis courts, and youth facilities right up and down the country. And I'm glad that her constituents are benefiting. Helen Morgan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government hasn't only broken its promises on new hospitals; it's also broken its pledge of 6,000 more doctors, with the number of qualified GPs having actually fallen. GPs in Shropshire are seeing 400 more patients each than they were in 2016, which is one of the biggest rises in the country. Places across the country, East Sussex, Devon, Cambridgeshire and Hampshire, have also seen the number of qualified GPs fall. Where will the Prime Minister end his the government's neglect of local health services and recruit and retain the GPs we need? Well, Mr Speaker, the, 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 the facts are this. There are 2,200 more GPs in general practice today. There are 15,000 more doctors doctors in the NHS and there are 30,000 more nurses and that's because we're putting record funding in and backing the NHS and getting patients the care that they need. Yeah, yeah. Robert Thank you, oh, Mr Mr. Speaker. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can I commend my, honourable, my right honourable friend in seizing, grasping the nettle and seeking to negotiate an agreement on the Northern Ireland Protocol? Yeah, yeah. Does he share my frustration with the express views of people who are commenting upon a deal that has yet to be reached? And does he agree with me? that the best way to reduce or even end the jurisdiction of the CJEU is through treaty change, uh, change itself and not through domestic legislation in this Parliament. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, Mr. Mr Speaker, my right honourable friend is absolutely right. We need to keep going, but he's also right that we need to find enduring solutions to the challenges faced by the people of Northern Ireland. And that's why, as the, uh, my right honourable friend mentioned earlier, it is 
absolutely right that we address the constitutional and legal framework of our arrangements and ensure that we can put in place new arrangements that secure Northern Ireland's place in the United Kingdom. Matt Weston. Yeah, Thank yeah. you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Prime Minister is no stranger to paying fines, uh, <laughs> but last week the £2.3 billion pounds he, he, he paid uh, to the EU after the UK government allowed Chinese fraudsters to flood Europe with cheap goods is the worst waste of public money. My question is simple. If he can find £2.3 billion to pay a fine, why can't he pay NHS workers and others the pay increases they deserve? Yeah. Oh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, he, 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 may, he may not have seen that the Royal College of Nursing are now in talks with the government about resol resolving the disputes, and I'm grateful to them. I'm grateful to them for entering to those talks uh, with a spirit of a constructive attitude, but also to calling off their strikes next week. What I would urge him and his colleagues to do is be on the side of working people, and that's to back our laws to introduce minimum safety levels across the NHS and transport, because that's the best way to demonstrate that you're on the side of hard-working families, Mr Speaker. Bill Wigan. I wholeheartedly support my Prime Minister's priority to stop the boats. So could he please bring in the small boats bill next week? Yeah, yeah. Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I thank my honourable friend for his support. I share with him uh, the same desire, which is to stop the boats, for all the reasons that we've discussed in this session. And he should rest assured that the Home Secretary and I are working intensely and as quickly as possible to bring forward that legislation, because what I want is what he wants, is to ensure that those people who come here Ill illegally will simply not be allowed to stay. Charlotte Nettles. Thank you, Mr Speaker. During recess, my community in Warrington was rocked by the murder of 16-year-old schoolgirl Brianna Jai. What support will the Prime Minister offer to our community and to our local schools in order to ensure that they have the support that they need to support Brianna's classmates and her family as we try to heal from this appalling tragedy? Prime Minister. Well, can I, can I thank my, the Honourable Lady for raising this issue and express my sympathies to Rihanna's family and friends for what's happened. I know she will be playing her part in her local community in supporting them at this difficult time. I know the Home Secretary is shortly due to visit the area and she will be able to discuss with the Honourable Lady what support can be provided to support the community at a time like this and she should know that she will have what she needs from the Government. Final question, Anthony Michael. Mr Speaker, I can't ask the Prime Minister to stop time or tide, but I might I ask him to offset it because in South Devon the Slapton line is being eroded away and I need him to help me lobby the Department for Transport and the DEFRA Secretary to see that we can get the repairs done because Natural England is standing in the way of this vital link and stopping us from doing the developments that we need to do. Will he support me? Yeah, yeah. Prime Minister. Well, Mr. Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is a fantastic campaigner and advocate for his constituents. I know that this particular issue is causing frustration and concern in his community. He He's absolutely right to raise it. I will ensure that he gets the appropriate meetings he needs with the ministers in question so we can work with him to try and find a resolution. That completes Prime Minister's questions. Right, we're going to uh, discuss what happened in PMQs with our uh, political editor, Beth Rigby, in a moment, but a couple of bits of breaking news to bring you that have occurred while we've been watching that. Uh, the Queen Consort has pulled out of another visit. Uh, she was going to go into the Felix Project charity in London with the King. Uh, she is continuing to recover from COVID, Buckingham Palace said, and she has a busy day ahead of her tomorrow. So it was taking it easy today in the hope that she'd be well enough to be out and about tomorrow. Also, uh, the inquest into the death of Nicola Bully has been opened and adjourned at Lancash Lancashire Coroner's Court. And they have heard in the last few minutes that she was identified by her dental records, the family not in attendance at the inquest, which was very brief uh, a short time ago. Final bit of breaking news. London Underground drivers uh, are to strike on the 15th of March, a significant day because it's budget day, uh, in a dispute over pensions and working arrangements. That's from their union. ASLEF will be getting more on that, I'm sure, throughout the rest of the day. Uh, in the meantime, let's return to Prime Minister's questions. Our political editor, Beth Rigby, is here. And Beth, perhaps no surprise, Northern Ireland really dominating the agenda for the Prime Minister. Yeah, very much so. And, and Keir, what Keir Starmer did there was he asked him a series of quite detailed questions, knowing 
that Rishi Sunak was not going to stand at that dispatch box and answer them in any way while these negotiations are still going on. And I should say as well that it has been very tightly held. Someone told me that um, one of the ministers, Steve Baker, who's a key Brexiteer, wasn't even brought into the room in terms of finding out what any detail of a deal was until Monday uh, this week. So everyone being kept out of the loop, apart from a core around the Prime Minister, which means the DUP don't necessarily know the contours of the deal, uh, the Brexiteer wing of the party, the ERG, don't either. Uh, and Keir Starmer, therefore, asking the Prime Minister questions, really, that he knew the Prime Minister wouldn't answer around uh, the role of the European Court of Justice in post-Brexit trade and arrangements in Northern Ireland, a big red line for many Brexiteers, uh, the role of EU legislation determining... Uh, issues around goods in Northern Ireland. Uh, you heard Geoffrey Donaldson there, uh, the DUP leader, saying uh, that there was no sense of uh, checks or any democratic consent that these rules are imposed on the DUP by, as they would put it, a foreign government or a foreign body, uh, and they don't have any uh, recourse on that. So that's a red line for them. So how does that affect uh, the deal. Uh, so really asking the Prime Minister questions that he couldn't and wouldn't answer and then obviously handing him or offering him the poison chalice at the end saying, well, if your own backbenchers won't uh, put this deal through the Commons for you, uh, we're here uh, willing and ready to help. And of course, politically, uh, this is exactly the sort of trouble Theresa May got into uh, when you remember those long Brexit wars uh, back in 2018 into 2019. And of course, Boris Johnson went on to become the Conservative Party leader in the summer of 2019. And really, this is a Prime Minister with a, a problem in terms of he's got to get the DUP on board. He then has to try and get the Brexiteers on board. All the while, there is Boris Johnson waiting in the wings, probably very happy to agitate if he sees these divisions playing out uh, against the Prime Minister. So it's a really difficult tightrope that Rishi Sunak is walking. And what you saw there was not obfuscation, but you, you saw a Prime Minister that couldn't answer uh, the questions. And it just gives a sense of, for all the momentum that Number 10 had last week, in the sense that this deal was going to get done, Rishi Sunak was going to unlock uh, the problems that have, you know, besieged previous uh, Conservative Prime Ministers and, and sought out once and for all the problems around post-Brexit trade and arrangements in Northern Ireland. You know, with every day that passes, uh, it seems like that, that, that quick solution is not there and there's a lot of intensive negotiations. This is a Prime Minister that's been in talks with uh, the DUP and the ERG and key Brexiteers all week trying to sort out a deal because he can strike a deal with Brussels, but if he can't sell it to the DUP and the ERG, that creates problems, not least because it means that the power sharing arrangement in Northern Ireland can't get up and running again. And isn't that really the point of all of this, to restore uh, that power sharing arrangement within Northern Ireland and also on his own back benches? All of the problems that were still there after Liz Truss was deposed and Rishi Sunak uh, put in place. They haven't gone away, they're just under the surface. And this now threatens to really bring back those internal Conservative divisions. So it wasn't a lively Prime Minister's questions, was it? No. But it was significant in terms of what it's telling us, not about the relationship really between Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak, but what it's telling us about the problems that Rishi Sunak now has with the backbenchers and a massive wedge of them that always wanted Boris Johnson to remain Prime Minister and would very much like Boris Johnson back in power. It is interesting, though, in the sense that you're, you're talking about people being kept out of the room. It, it's, it suggests that the talks are actually achieving something, that there is progress being made. If, if there's stuff that they don't want people to know about, it means that they're, they're actually getting stuff agreed, doesn't it? Stuff that they don't want people to know about worries that it's going to leak. I think the issue is around these negotiations which previous Prime Ministers and people that I've spoken to that were familiar with incarnations of this uh, under Boris Johnson and then before Boris Johnson under Theresa May, is that for the DUP, what they want to see is a legal agreement. You heard Geoffrey Donaldson say it there. They want to see it in black and white. They want the legal text. It's the same as the ERG, who will always get lawyers to pour over these 
documents. Uh, and so the issue is, is if you keep everyone out until you struck a deal with Brussels and you don't bring these other parties in, then you might, you might secure a deal, but if you can't sell the deal, what, what, what is the deal worth? And I think that's been some of the issues around it, which is why the idea that you can just bring everyone on, on board with, with discussing it without actually seeing an agreement. I mean, some of the um, Brexiteers that I've spoken to and certainly uh, one of the ministers that I've spoken to keep saying, well, we haven't seen a text yet. So some ministers are on resignation watch. And when you say, well, what are you thinking? Do you think you might have to resign? Can you not live with this in good conscience? Can you adhere to cabinet and, and collective government collective responsibility? They want to see the text and the devil is in the detail, if you like. So for all of Rishi Sunak's tight uh, negotiations with Brussels, he has to sell it to Northern Ireland and he has to sell it to his backbenchers. And that really is always the biggest hurdle in any of this. OK, Beth, thanks very much. Well, while that was going on, President Vladimir Putin has been holding a massive rally in Moscow today. It comes after he met China's top diplomat in the Russian capital a little earlier, saying that the two countries have reached new levels of cooperation. Well, diplomat Wang Yi is in Russia for talks on new agreements between Beijing and Moscow, uh, touting the two countries' partnerships as a new era and that, that they continue to operate at a high level. He also said that regardless of the changes of the international situation, China is willing to maintain a good momentum in the development of a new model of major power relationship. Well, let's go live to Moscow and our correspondent, Diana Magne. Uh, two things to talk about, really, Diana. But, but first of all, in terms of China relations, uh, how significant is this visit and the fact that, that Wang Yi has now actually met the, the Prime Minister, not just Sergei Lavrov? Um, well, I think he's, he's due to be meeting the president. Um, uh, and I think it's very significant. This is the end of a European tour for Wang Yi. He was at the